Good morning. Good morning to everybody uh, on this Friday, the uh, third uh, third day of the uh, Urban Festival 2021. And uh, we're still uh, looking to uh, rebuild and reinvent uh, the city. Uh, my name is Ayabong Atawe. Uh, I'm the MC for the first parts of our sessions uh, today. And uh, we uh, have the pleasure of uh, receiving this morning an opening address uh, from the South African Cities Network's chairperson and uh, the executive mayor of uh, Buffalo City, uh, Councillor Kola Pagati. Uh, we'll also have an opportunity, as we did yesterday as well, to just uh, give some reflections on the discussions that were held yesterday uh, and also get a spoken word performance from uh, uh, Emma. Uh, and then we'll also have a chance to get a, a lecture uh, from the board chairperson of the South African Cities Network, uh, Yoli Sakani. Uh, and uh, we'll also uh, have uh, quite a jam-packed uh, uh, opening session this morning because after that lecture we'll also have an opportunity uh, to uh, get a panel discussion that'll be uh, uh, chaired by uh, uh, Rashik uh, and that will involve Sean Cook, Gail Jennings and Offensa Mukwena uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, and uh, uh, go into our subsequent sessions. Uh, we'd love for all of you to join us for all of our sessions uh, today and uh, as uh, we've been doing over the last few days or so also join us on social media. Uh, we are out on Twitter on at SA Cities Network uh, you can also uh, follow uh, the uh, National Department of uh, Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs on at National uh, COGTA and uh, also the uh, National Department of Human Settlements on uh, at the underscore DHS. Uh, and you can also join uh, Salga as well on at Salga underscore Gov. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag Urban Fest 2021, hashtag the Rebuilt City, uh, hashtag Urban Month. Uh, and uh, a real pleasure to have you all uh, for this uh, third day. Now, uh, without uh, much further delay, allow me at this point uh, to uh, also uh, um, welcome uh, onto our platform to give us some opening remarks, uh, the chairperson of the South African Cities Networks Council, and that is the executive mayor of uh, Buffalo City, uh, Councillor Kola Pagat. Mkhegaz, the platform is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, the chairperson of the board of the Cities Network, Ms. Kani, and the management of the Cities Network, representatives from COGTA and other government departments, the private sector, civil society organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today is the third and final day of the 2021 Urban Festival which is hosted by the South African Cities Network under the theme of the rebuilt city, rising from the crisis of emergency governance to a more sustainable and resilient future. This year's theme was born from a desire to provide urban actors with actionable information and sustainable frameworks, knowledge and resources to navigate the new world of emergency governance. Beyond today, the goal is to inform responses to grand uh, challenges, which are increasingly, which are increasingly framed as complex emergencies and include above all pandemics and climate change. COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on all aspects of daily life and revealed serious systemic risks for cities. It has exposed the frailties in local economies, finances, health response, and planning. A chasm between city governments and their citizens and inadequate risk management and crisis planning by cities. At the same time, on a more positive note, COVID-19 has forced a rethinking of city governance to reset, recalibrate, and build back better. For me as an interested party and participant in urban dialogue, 
The Epen Festival is an important platform that highlights the practical efforts being made by citizens, civil society, government, and the private sector to build uh, resilience capacities, improve cooperation and collaboration among the stakeholders, and promote innovative practices in finances and resource management as part of emergency responses. The festival program has included rigorous engagements aimed at accelerating urban agenda. As it draws to a close, I call upon everyone to continue using this platform as a place of convergence of minds, as we maneuver through the uncharted waters of multiple crises in our cities. I encourage you all to continue to actively put forth your voices towards common solutions and practices. In welcoming you to the final day of the 2021 Epen Festival, I invite you to capitalize on this opportunity and to gain valuable okay. insight. Given that obtaining more sustainable is a collaborative, collaborative. I leave you with this inspiring quote from Martin Luther King, and I quote, and an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity, end quote. Rebuilding cities starts here. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Executive Mayor, uh, for those opening remarks and, of course, uh, for uh, the uh, challenge that you are laying down to all of us uh, to uh, continue to uh, rigorously engage uh, as uh, we try and use uh, the space that the Urban Festival has afforded us uh, to uh, really uh, work through some of the issues uh, that will ensure that our cities are resilient to the many crises that we are going to be faced with, inevitably so. Uh, and a big part of yesterday's discussion uh, was really around uh, being able to unpack, I guess, uh, the uh, critical elements of that. And uh, we'll have an opportunity after uh, Emma's contribution uh, to uh, get uh, uh, some reflections uh, from myself and uh, just a summation of uh, uh, what uh, uh, had unfolded in many of the sessions that we had uh, yesterday. So uh, without further delay, uh, allow me at this point uh, with the mayor having opened our session uh, on uh, uh, this uh, Friday, the third day of the Urban Festival, uh, to uh, call up uh, Emama Abie, who is going to give us uh, a spoken word performance uh, just to uh, get us going uh, on this morning. Emma, the platform is yours. Thank you so much, Ayabonga. Good morning, everyone. Um, Ayabonga, once again, please just give me a thumbs up if you can hear this backtrack. Uh, okay. All right, before I jump into my final performance for this year's festival, I would like to thank whichever voices or hands were raised to bring me back here this year. Thank you so much for trusting me with this mammoth task. Thank you to Urban Festival for giving poetry a platform and for making arts alive in the space. Um, my utmost gratitude, thank you. Now, in order to rebuild a city, you need to envision it, dream it. So, on dreaming. One sheep, two sheep, three sheep, four sheep, five sheep, sleep. Welcome. This is your magic hour, the meeting of gods with man, the sifting of soul through spirit. Gravity has kept your body down there. There are visions that do not belong to that plane. It's not entrusted to carry it. So close your eyes, sacrifice your breath, out. summon all the light within to traverse this darkness. Man has no resurrection power, but here 
you keep late friend and foe alive. Feel your worst nightmare. Taste the fruit of forbidden fantasies. Hear the welcoming wings of your utopia. See the unsearchable. This cosmos is no respecter of persons and tenses. The poetic and scientific pray and speak in the same tongue. The past and future fluently marry into a now moment. We think it's easier done than said here. Forgive your conscious eye and the limitation of language to recollect visions from the darkness of sleep. So, when you awake to count your breaths again, it may seem everything is faint, yet nothing is alien. Rehearse the familiar, immerse in conception, create what eye has not seen, no ear has heard, nor the unconscious conceived. The South African Cities Network, Department of Cooperative Governance, Department of Human Settlements and Partners welcomes you to Urban Festival 2020. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, for that uh, arousing performance. And uh, uh, we are now, uh, I guess, uh, have uh, duly opened our third day uh, of uh, the uh, Urban Festival 2021. And uh, uh, it also, I guess, is an opportunity for us to uh, maybe uh, take some time to take stock of how far we've come over the last few days or so. And in particular, uh, if we think about the discussions we had yesterday in the opening session, um, the uh, remarks to open our sessions yesterday from Monica Glinsler, uh, uh, who spoke to us from the Department of Human Settlements around the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, ecological, and of course, social, and the importance in the social dimension of placemaking um, in thinking about not only how we upgrade informal settlements, but how we create an inclusive uh, human settlements paradigm in our society. Now, that was very important because, in a sense, one of the things she was talking about was that what we see with urbanization and migration is, in many instances, the urbanization and the migration of poverty. 40% of much of the expansion that we see into cities globally is, in, is an expansion into informal forms of human settlements. Uh, we also had an opportunity to hear from uh, Monique Krana, uh, who spoke to us about some of the work that they had been doing around participatory forms of community engagement out in Soweto uh, as, as a way of really defining and determining how uh, the urban form and the urban shape takes root out in Soweto. We had an opportunity to also have a session uh, that looked at the race to decarbonize our cities. Um, and in many ways, this was around how do we make sure that the defining transition, which is uh, uh, certainly our energy transition around making not only what we produce, where we live and how we play, to be much more ecologically sensitive and ecologically sustainable, um, has a lot to do with how we think about our spaces. Uh, and of course, in this undertaking, we can't uh, lose sight of uh, the many challenges that we have around inequality and poverty, and the link between this energy transition and of course, uh, the quality uh, of uh, uh, health in many of the cities that we have. We also had an opportunity in session seven yesterday uh, to look at affordable housing as a key driver of sustainable cities. Uh, we spoke about the challenges of uh, uh, you know, some of the massive shortages where demand effectively outstrips supply in the provision of affordable housing, affordable rental stock. In many ways, a critical lever in ensuring that urban regeneration and restructuring takes root. There are many interesting examples that were spoken about, including the Umastan, the microcredit funding scheme, which is really about unlocking funding for uh, backyard rentals in a vibrant and in a thriving manner that allows uh, many of those who have invested in that space to access uh, all of the benefits that come with this relatively informal housing market. And in a way, it's about firstly meeting demand. It's about being able to do that at the right pace and scale but also offering opportunities to test green housing materials in new builds. And of course, supporting the densification, infilling, and of course, uh, mixed uses uh, and compacting of uh, city experiences and really trying to confront uh, the historic and contemporary drivers of what we see 
uh, insofar as urban sprawl is concerned. Session eight was a very fascinating session uh, and uh, uh, Rashid Fatah, our curator uh, for the festival had an opportunity of course to be part of that session uh, which was uh, really looking uh, in many ways, I guess, at uh, what do we do with our streets as public spaces? How do we rethink, reimagine those spaces? And there were some experiences that were shared from many cities from across the world, uh, places like Milan, Barcelona, some experiences from Kailicha as well. Uh, and let me give Rashik just a brief moment uh, to touch on uh, some of the key things that came out of that particular session. Rashik. Thanks, Ayabonga. I think uh, one of the key points was, you know, uh, we need to be tough against traffic engineers and transport officials, because uh, uh, as Tony Garcia said from Street Plans Collaborative, mm. uh, we shouldn't wait for the new normal, we should define it. Yeah. And I think that means that, uh, you know, what is, uh, if, if cost is not a barrier to take an intersection near yeah, public transport interchanges, add paint and color, give commuters and pedestrians more space and safety, if, if we can't do that, then obviously, if it's not a financial or a technical barrier, then there must be another barrier that is a human barrier. And so a lot of the work in Milan and we've seen in the US, um, uh, which is already happening in the in uh, many informal settings in South Africa is temporary tactical humans changing their own environment. Um, the problem is once we touch streets and pavements, you sort of upset uh, 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 hundreds of years of um, of a legacy in South Africa where transport was used to divide communities. And so you're not just touching on uh, road regulations, you're sort of hitting a nerve where um, roads and uh, transport and uh, pavements, um, you know, was used as a tool to, uh, to oppress people. And I think uh, when, we, when you start to see humans painting uh, large yellow dots on road surfaces within a planned environment or expanding pavements, um, you, you're sort of shifting an entire paradigm. So, uh, our, our goal of the session was not to copy Milan or to copy um, uh, Miami or to uh, you know, try to do what Kampala is doing, but it's just, just to say that there really are examples where with uh, very few resources, there are quick, uh, cheap and easy interventions. Um, and there must be a reason why in South Africa, we are not doing this quickly and efficiently. And, uh, and uh, from Barcelona, from Carolyn, we heard that really this is about health as well you know, road fatalities, um, pedestrians being knocked over, um, without having to redesign entire uh, street grids, we could really put these interventions into place, which are um, sometimes temporary, um, and really just require um, some leniency uh, mm -hmm. over time, because it already happens, you know, the theme of this year is about adapting and being resilient. And, and if we can't, in a global pandemic, implement minor changes, Extra, extra space for informal traders on pavements, extra space for restaurants to spill over into streets, mm. um, then we really aren't maybe fighting hard enough. And uh, then, then perhaps it should be a national agenda. We should contact uh, our president and, and go from that level because it's certainly not happening on a, on a city level. Thanks, Ayubanda. Thank, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Rashik, for, for that reflection uh, on uh, what had come out uh, of uh, session eight yesterday. And uh, of course, some of the things that we can do at multiple levels uh, to uh, reimagine and rethink uh, and also rebuild our cities. We also know uh, that we also had activations that uh, started yesterday. And uh, the first one was uh, happening out in uh, Slovo Park uh, here in Johannesburg, uh, which uh, was a combination, of course, of a group of young people coming together to use their digital skills hub uh, to uh, uh, share uh, some of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, their experiences on how uh, they're looking to transform uh, a Slovo Park uh, and also looking on how to clean and make greener uh, some of the uh, new developments that are happening in that part of the world. Um, there's also an opportunity uh, that there was yesterday to install a wash trough. Uh, and uh, you can see in those visuals there uh, also uh, uh, the uh, uh, community members coming together to build that wash trough. And of course, that young gentleman also uh, out in a food garden. Uh, uh, in uh, the uh, area there in Slovo Park. So we'll continue uh, as our discussions unfold to give you some reflections from uh, those on the ground activations that are happening as well. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the activations head out uh, to the port of Durban today and uh, uh, Maritime Youth Innovation Day and uh, led by the Eteguini Maritime Cluster. Uh, there's a program today 
that will be shedding light on uh, the endeavors that the city of Teguini is undertaking uh, to become a smart port city. So uh, certainly a lot happening, not only just on these platforms uh, here, these digital platforms, but also uh, in the activations that are happening on the ground and uh, activations are happening uh, tomorrow as well out in Langa in uh, Cape Town, uh, a bicycle, uh, a bus activation day that's happening there and uh, uh, opportunity to learn a bit more about the Langa bicycle hub and uh, the efforts of Mzikwanam Gerdle to promote cycling uh, in his neighborhood, uh, Piaskwom. So uh, yeah, if uh, you are out in uh, Cape Town, uh, certainly do uh, take some time to uh, go check that out. And uh, the details on how you can uh, get hold of that uh, are also out on the sacities.net website uh, on the Urban Festival page. Without much uh, further delay, uh, colleagues, allow me at this point uh, to uh, welcome uh, onto uh, our platform, uh, uh, Sisiole Sakani, uh, who is uh, going to be uh, uh, sharing with us uh, uh, her lecture on mobility as the foundation of rebuilding cities. Ms. Yoli Sakani is uh, a board chairperson of the South African Cities Network and also a chief business development officer at uh, Transnet. Uh, and uh, Ms. Yolisa, we look forward to your remarks and uh, the platform is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ayabonga, and uh, good morning and a warm welcome to all of you on the platform. Special welcome to, and good, special good morning, sorry, to the chairperson of the, of the council. Emma, thank you so much for that beautiful rendition that really got us thinking. Uh, Ayabonga, I, I did not prepare a lecture. I, I actually prepared a conversation that, that um, articulates some of the questions I have. Around... Even better. Even better. <laughs> I, I've got nothing to teach. <laughs> I've got a lot to learn myself. I mean, the president announced the economic reconstruction and recovery plan in 2020, whose objectives, of course, are to stimulate an equitable and um, inclusive growth to tackle our historical structural inequalities, unemployment and poverty. I must say this is this is not an, an, an it's not an, un, an unknown. This is something that we, we've always been striving for. I strongly believe that every sector has the responsibility uh, to assist government in achieving these, uh, these objectives, but more so our, 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 our sector, which is the, the built uh, environment, uh, including urban planning, transportation, and I'd like to say freight and logistics sector, which is the backbone of our uh, uh, economy. It, it's literally uh, the economy of the country sits on the shoulders of, of, of our freight and logistics systems. If I had the time, I, I would unpack what that means, but I'm sure you're well aware of the challenges that we are experiencing globally in the supply chain as a result of our reaction. And I, I suppose we knew no better to COVID-19. I do, however, want to take a deep dive into mobility as a foundation of rebuilding cities in the few minutes that I have. I'd like to say, start by saying that cities are not simply a random collection of buildings and, and people. They have to exhibit a functional structure that is all inclusive. They have to have a special form that allows them to function commercially in terms of production, leisure, education, and social. And, and, and when I listened to your recapping of the discussions in the prior days, uh, I suppose we all aligned on, on what it takes uh, or what it means to, 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 to define a city as a sustainable and, and, and obviously a resilient city. So what is a, a sustainable and resilient city? I think as I've already indicated that it's one that is all inclusive. It's one that takes into consideration social, economic and environmental impact as you probably are following COP26, you're picking up all the, all the stuff that is, you know, it's, we've, we've been speaking about these things for the longest of time and you have to ask yourself, what are we missing? What are we missing in, in, in redesigning functional cities that are supported uh, specific to my topic by an integrated transportation system that is functional, inclusive and efficient. I do want to say that in South Africa in particular, I don't think we have a problem of uh, supply of public transport. I have a sense that we have, a, we have an oversupply. We have a rail network that is not, uh, it's hardly utilized and even worse uh, 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 since the, the start of, uh, of COVID. We have a 
proliferation of taxis on, on the road and a, a bus system that is, is, is losing its market share. Is it then a case of a lack of policies? I don't think so. I think there might be obsolete needing to be reviewed here and then and, and so that we can catch up with uh, the, the innovative methods of, of mobility, but we do have good policies that are well intending. Is it the dichotomy between private sector's innovative solutions like mobility as a service and government's lethargy and reactionary stance? I personally experienced this in my previous um, experience, uh, in my previous profession as I was the head of policy, public policy at Uber. And I found that in every conversation that I, I, I was having with government and the rest of the stakeholders, that it was not a case of not wanting the, the, the innovation. It was a case of not understanding how to bring it to the fore as well as regulating it. Is it still a case of transport and urban planners at loggers heads in terms of who leads the pack? I suspect so, I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, it's, I, I'm sure uh, it's been discussed at length in the past uh, days. I do want to say that the coronavirus threw the spanner in the works uh, in the space of mobility. And I would have thought that with the majority of people working from home, it would have changed the way we, we view uh, uh, the future of work for good. But I do want to say I've observed in the couple of weeks or months how traffic is slowly picking up again, which then means that we go going back to our old ways of doing things. I have a couple of questions that I want us to ask ourselves. We might not uh, be able to respond to them uh, because we have a lineup of other uh, equally interesting uh, topics to, to take care of. But I, I, I know for a fact that the Gauw train has lost its patronage since the beginning of lockdown last year. And you will know, uh, if you don't, you, you, you have to know that the Gauw train by and large is uh, accommodating the market that we usually call the stubborn market. These are the guys that are already owning a car or two cars, the, the household. Not a bad thing to target because those are the guys who really wanted to migrate from, from road to rail. But those people are now working from home. They've got access to Wi-Fi. They've got flexible working environments. So what about the people that are stuck in the public transport system? What about the people that still have to queue for hours so that they, they, they're able to get to work uh, at 8, uh, 8, 8, 8, 8 a.m.? Would it be... Uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to think about how to make the how train accessible to the people that are captive to public transport? Wouldn't it just be? It would then mean we'd have to rethink the pricing uh, of that public transport system. But right now it's running empty and it's heavily subsidized by, 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 by government, our taxpayer, our tax, I suppose, or by the taxpayer. It's just a question. My next question is that it's also a known known that the rail network is underutilized. I suppose it's a lot of things. Um, it's 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 the fact that it's 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 you've got human settlement on the rail network, you've got cable theft, you've got you've got you've got. But I don't understand how is it at this point in time we have not figured out how to bring in the existing public transport operators, taxis and buses, I'm really not bothered about who comes on board, but I think it's important if we are to achieve an integrated system uh, within the rail network or within the country, bring in the private sector, bring in government. And I think the three collectively can look at a better way of, or better ways of, of maximizing that infrastructure. Well, I suppose now there's, there's hardly any infrastructure. I doubt if government will be able to rebuild that. But uh, the rail network, the metro system is at the core of a functioning city. And um, that, that, that's something that I suppose that's known to all of us. The other question I want to ponder, a little bit controversial, what if we canceled BRT systems in those cities that are still planning the BRT system 11 years after it was supposed to be running? What if we just canceled it and then channeled that money towards uh, a bus system, an integrated bus system or an integrated public transport system, which means running uh, buses, smaller buses, 
integrating the, those with the, with the taxi industry. And I'm not, I'm not saying these things because I'm I'm I'm, I'm like Emma, one, two, three, four, five, and 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 sleep. Lovely, lovely, lovely stuff. Emma, I'm not in any way uh, belittling that. I'm simply saying I'm not dreaming. I'm just trying to 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 stimulate our, our minds and think about a different way of approaching this. More often than not, I find that, um, and I think the gentleman who spoke before I did spoke about we don't want to emulate Milan. We want to do things that are within our context and within our reality. So those are my closing remarks. I, I look forward to hearing uh, new things, new ways of doing things now that COVID has, has, has helped us to look at things differently. Now that COVID has pushed us to be a little bit more uh, uh, innovative in, in our ways of doing things. And I wish uh, the speakers, the next speakers, and I look forward to, to listening to them all the best in the engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sosiolisa, for those remarks. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know if if uh, we answer those questions together because I think the one on, on the bus rapid transit system is a very interesting one, um, especially in light of uh, you know some of the challenges that uh, that particular model has faced. Um, and of course, also the macro fiscal implications uh, of uh, continuing allocations uh, from that. So, so I'd be interested uh, uh, maybe executive mayor to hear some uh, remarks from yourself uh, on some of the questions that uh, Usis Yolisa has asked. Uh, so, uh, uh, Councillor Kolapagati, any views um, just on some of the, the questions that um, Usis Yolisa has raised? Uh, I mean, the one I guess is around, you know, whether or not many of the uh, uh, existing transport nodes and uh, transit nodes are being used at full capacity. I think it's clear in the, the case of the Khao train and even with our passenger rail that we're probably not firing on all cylinders there. But uh, some of your thoughts, I guess, on the, on the uh, approach to the bus rapid transit system, uh, which is something that no doubt you, you would have been thinking about. Councillor Pagati. Maybe, maybe Cecilia, if you're still with us, just to follow up. Um, I mean, I, fi I find the comment you made quite interesting um, around the bus rapid transit system. And I've always wondered wh what the thinking might have been around the interface between this as a new form of, you know, bus, uh, passenger bus service alongside some of the historically, uh, you know, older ones that would have existed. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, in, um, in Quebeca, the, it would be Algoa. Um, and of course, uh, at what, what the interface uh, uh, would potentially be between that and newer forms of uh, uh, BRT investments that are being made at the city level. What, what, what had the thinking been uh, at the time when many of these things were being designed? Man, we, uh, we need a day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I'm, I'm gonna try and be brief. Mm. BRT was never meant for all the cities in, 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 in South Africa. BRT started as a concept in the city of Johannesburg where the then political head in transport wanted to introduce a bus service in Soweto. The metro bus doesn't go into a town townships. It runs in the suburbs. And then she saw that as a, you know, it's, it's inequality of note for the government of, 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 of today. Be that as it may in our conversation with the taxi industry, they were quite clear in their minds that there's absolutely no way that they had been driving the streets of Soweto before they were tired and um, having to suffer wear and tear on their vehicles. We tired Soweto, if you remember that program of tar tiring Soweto. Now that the roads were tired, we now want to bring in a private bus system or, or a bus system and leave them out of, 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 of that conversation. That's when then there was a delegation that went to South America and looked at what would be possible in South Africa. And that's, that, that's how we emulated the, the, the Colombian, uh, Colombian met, uh, uh, system. It, it, it's very similar to us in many ways. But fast forward, what then happened is that at that time, it was a couple of years before uh, the FIFA World Cup, the, a decision was then taken to say, how about we roll out something similar in all the cities that are going to be hosting the World Cup? Noble idea, but you could have left it at uh, Gauteng, and uh, Cape Town, KZN, 
the rest of the cities and not because they don't deserve a quality public transport system, you could have invested in an integrated transport system, lesser infrastructure, and then take the money and, and, and channel it towards the operations themselves and bringing those taxis and those buses together as bus operating companies. That could have worked. Now look at Msumbuzi. I don't know why Msumbuzi must have a rapid, but the numbers are not there, but yeah. they do need and they do deserve a quality public transport system. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm trying to say. We then made it a one size fits all kind of solution and it's not working, it will never work. Mm -hmm. And then on high speed trains, uh, I know you have to you have to leave us in the next uh, uh, two minutes. Or so, I'll, but I'll stay. I'll stay. I'll stay until. Yeah, the end. I'm interested in the how train example that you're making because I think it's very important um, that we should ideally be making it accessible to people whose primary mode of mobility is public transport. But even with the subsidies, it's inaccessible. You must never build a, something like that on on the basis of class. Mm -hmm. You mm. must. You, you, you just cannot. If you look at the, the mobility patterns of people that are stuck in public transport, it's a crime. Now, I'll, so the hard train stops in Rhodesfield, but in Rhodesfield, it doesn't pick up anyone because it's a, no, no, it doesn't. You can mm. get off, but you can't pick up. And, and I could be wrong, but when we asked this question at that time, it was a case of, but the guys that you, the market there can't afford the train. Are you, because are, mm -hmm. the, so, 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 so all I'm saying is that you can't build that thing again. N don't build this thing. I'm not saying we don't need a quality public transport system. We certainly, we most certainly do. I stay in the West. There is no bus system coming this way. Mm. I need some form of a, a, I don't know, public transport system of some sort. But all I'm saying is that you can't build, this is a human basic human right and it can't be built on the basis of class mm -hmm. open the doors of this thing in fact how about we made public transport system free hmm. now how about what subsidy we models would, would we need for that what, what forms of redistributory taxes and subsidies would we need for that i don't know we'd have to figure it out it's running empty anyway it's as good as free so all, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that when you talk to our citizens and they tell you the things that they're struggling with, they're mm. struggling with human settlement. Yeah. They are struggling with uh, a, a public transport, but they're not going to talk about public transport. They're struggling with water, lights, and, 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 and the rest. But they will then talk more about human settlement and water and lights. But in actual fact, they spend more than 20% of their disposable income on public transport. Mm. Mm. But a basic need for them is that I need a shelter. Everything else is 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 uh, is, uh, is 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 secondary. So again, um, I am none of these things are bad ideas. But you, it's you've got to figure out what works for us. And BRT system for us is not going to work in Musumbus. Yeah, there's a, a few interesting comments that are coming through and maybe just an, another comment I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask you, you know, we've spoken a lot over the last few days or so around, you know, the ecological sustainability of cities. M many people have argued that many of our main cities in South Africa um, are really designed, the vision is designed around, you know, every household having an automobile, basically. Um, and should we be closing off certain spaces for the movement of vehicles and trying to think about different sort of transit-oriented development nodes. Um, I mean, somebody once said, what would happen if you closed off Santon uh, to vehicles and everybody would have to, I guess, walk in? What, what implication would that have, you know, for the free flow of uh, traffic around some of the critical nodes? So rather than the movement of vehicles, the movement of people. Some of your thoughts on that. I mean, you're, uh, again, you're opening a drum of snakes. Let, 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 me, let, me, so let me take Kempton Park where I had worked. When we calculated vehicular movements within Kempton Park, we're sitting at about 300,000. Kempton Park, they're not going out of Kempton Park, they're circulating within Kempton Park. And if I'm the, in the Metropole building and I want to go to wherever the more, why do I have to take a car? So it's not built for people. It's cities, we're not building our cities for people who are solving a, a vehicular problem. And, and the more you solve it, the, the, the more the, the problem grows. That we can expand on that some other time. I want to go back to when lockdown happened. 
street vendors could not participate uh, in, in, in selling their goods. They were closed out. Only pick and pay and checkers could work. It then meant that if you're in Soweto, you must catch a bus or a taxi to the nearest mall. To, why aren't we building self-sustaining and, 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 and self-contained? So that you, so what we're doing, we keep on generating a need to move from one place to the other for longer distances. We build, we're expanding uh, the, these townships. And, and I guess the gentleman that spoke before me talk about, spoke about the, the evidence. So we're still there. We're still, we're still taking it to the, to, to the outskirts. If you are in Soweto, everything you need must be in Soweto. Travel because you want to, not because mm -hmm. you have to. We've closed down Soweto before it worked. It worked, but it was an experiment. It was for some or other festival. And then a month later we stopped and life carried on again. And that's what we do. That's what we're good at. Sure. Yeah. Hey. A lot of questions coming through uh, and a lot of comments. And let me maybe pick up on um, one of those uh, from uh, Lone Paulson. He says the BRT in principle is a good system um in metropolitan areas however it's predominantly an engineering driven solution rather than a solution driven by people um and the public space around the stations is not pedestrian friendly and is retrofitted landscape exercise rather than designed public user space uh, and i guess we we lose out on the opportunity of creating viable high streets linked to those transport nodes because they just stick out like a sore thumb um and really not user friendly for any i guess meaningful informal trade around it. Let me tell you what the conversations we used to have in the boardroom. So we'd say, but all, all of this infrastructure, why can't we, mm. so where does the taxi and another bus fit in? I'm not talking about a BRT bus, another mode. Where does it, no, 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 this is strictly for BRT. And that's what we did. We built strictly for BRT and everything that's being said is correct. I mean, let's take the city of Johannesburg. We were the first ones to implement a BRT. It came with a, high floor, totally inaccessible, uh, inaccessible rather. But we could have taken those lessons from the city of Johannesburg because we were pressed on time. We had to deliver this thing before the world cut. There was no time to think about all of it. We could have, I suppose, but everyone else that came after that could have taken those lessons and, and put them to, to, to good use. Um, so I, I suppose it's, it's not far off the mark to say that mm -hmm. it was, it was looking at one thing and not a system or an integrated system. If, if, you, if, if, you, if, if you're selling something at the taxi rank, surely we can find a way of accommodating you. It doesn't have to be at the station, that wouldn't work. But that's where we then have to ask ourselves, how did we fail on transit oriented develop, uh, development? How is yeah. it that those corridors have not been densified? And let me tell you something. You then look at the development around how train and sentin, it's booming. It's beyond imagination. Then go to Togoza Park in Soweto and see what development is around the BRC station. Nada. Mm. It's yeah, serious. yeah. It's, it's a decision that we make as government that it makes sense if it's in Sentin, who cares what happens further down in the South? This is uh, Rashik, one of our uh, curators here was saying, how many truths could Yolis Akani give us in one session? I think we maybe need a, a few more sessions. Uh, so. We're going to have to close it off here, but um, thank you. it's been a real pleasure uh, to have you on the platform. And uh, thank you very much uh, for those remarks and sharing some of your rich insights uh, with us. Uh, I'll leave it to the organizers to organize a follow-up. Thank you. Session, but That's thank you very much. That'll be good. All the best. Time. Take care. Awesome stuff. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Rashik, and uh, we're going to have um, a uh, panel discussion, uh, which uh, will include Sean Cook, Kyle Jennings, and Ofensa Mukwena. And I can assure you a lot of what we just spoken about with Usus Yolisa around mobility uh, as a foundation for how we rethink and how we think differently and rebuild our cities is uh, going to form a big part of uh, this uh, next discussion. So Rashik, uh, let me hand over to you uh, and uh, to your guests, Sean, Gail, and Offensa. Thank you so much, everyone. Going. Thank you, Yulisa Kani, for the, I think, the perfect uh, introduction to this discussion. Um, thank you so much, Ofensa, Gail, and Sean, for joining us. Um, I know each of them uh, well in different spaces, uh, both in person before the pandemic and through their research, um, often pioneering research, um, giving us uh, 
truths. I remember having conversations around whether uh, density was enough to make BRT viable. And, and, uh, and these panelists are often involved in, in I suppose, uh, sort of shifting our perceptions and what we assumed to be true about, about transport and mobility and transport systems as a whole. So thank you very much. I'm not going to go through your extensive bios, um, <laughs> but Sean Cook is a doctoral researcher at the Center for Transport Studies and the African Center for Cities at UCT. Um, Gail Jennings, the extraordinaire, is an independent researcher focusing on a range of, of mobility issues from health to uh, amazing reports on walkability in African cities, sustainable mobility. Um, Gail has produced work in terms of the uh, cycling efforts across Africa, bicycle maps. <laughs> uh, there is an endless uh, list of impactful work from Gail. Um, and Ofensa Mokwena, who's uh, currently, I suppose more recently, <laughs> uh, apart from being a transport economist and research analyst, and, uh, and also on social media, sharing these, these amazing research uh, in these sort of uh, truth sound bites, uh, is also a uh, uh, analyst at, well, it's currently with Uber. Um, as of uh, a few days ago, I believe. So thank you very much for joining us. I know this is a, a big topic uh, to cover. Um, the question we're focusing on today is whether the planning of transport or transport planning can help our cities build resilience, uh, recover from crisis, and, uh, and actually uh, in the long, short and medium term, whether there is scope for, uh, for this to be the foundation of this recovery or not. Um, uh, and so I think I'll, I'll start with uh, sharing my screen. I hope the panelists don't mind uh, that we, we sort of uh, uh, cover uh, each time frame individually. And uh, you're all obviously welcome to, to contribute, um, but just a reminder that this is the, uh, the focus for this session and we have an, until about nine, 55 to solve all mobility and transport issues and, and, and rebuild cities in the process. So just to remind our question, how does a process of transport planning need to change to be resilient to future crises? And can mobility be the foundation for crisis response, rebuilding uh, and future resilience? Um, I'll start with the short term or the immediate term and I'll sort of make live notes as we're speaking. Um, Gail, I'm not sure this is where you want to dive in, but um, how can transport and mobility systems and the planning of it be more responsive and react in the short term? And what comes to mind is the day that uh, I think it was the, apart from the, the violence seen between uh, taxi companies, uh, I recall uh, at the Cape Town CBD bus interchange, uh, I think it was people waiting between six and eight hours to get home because a lot of the taxi services stopped, the central line wasn't operating. Um, Gail, is there a way for us to respond and react when, when faced with these crises? Well, I think there are ways, but, uh, but we're not doing them. <laughs> so, I mean, if, I think, um, so, th yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the short answer to the short-term um, uh, issue. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it would be useful if we, if we discuss this as, as a group, but I think one of the one of the things that that you know, you know we're going to be talking for for ever about what COVID taught us, but one of the 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 key things that I think we learned from COVID, or we, possibly we didn't learn, but is that we seem to we as in South Africa seems to be caught between a, a peculiar um, fear of of. Um, being under-regulated. So we always worry about, you know, we, we don't regulate this enough, you know, we've got too much informality. But at the same time, we are, are over-regulated to the point that <clears throat> we can't easily respond and react. So a lot of the, the ways that, for example, cities in Europe um, and the UK responded during COVID with things like pop-up bicycle infrastructure, um, you know, those, those kind of issues, even what we've been talking about with more space for, <clears throat> for vendors on street side, those are things that, that European cities managed to respond to very quickly. And South African cities just couldn't. There's too much uh, red tape, too many, uh, too much around, no, 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 this is not part of the process, this is not on the master plan. This isn't, this isn't how, you know, but this isn't what we want to do. So while it was quite possible yeah. to, to absolutely 
dramatically change everything about mobility by decree, in a sense, which was what lockdown. But but after that, there was no way to respond um, rapidly. And this is this is an, a peculiar, uh, you know, I don't know if it's peculiar to South Africa, but I think it's um, we we seem to be so caught in this desire to be to offer a world class kind of system or world class whatever it might be that and we seem to equate that this with formality and regulation and yet a lot of the cities or countries that we might aspire to in terms of world class are very much more able to to be more rapidly responsive so so i mean that's just something that i think um I'm, I'm not giving an answer about how we can be more responsive, but it did reveal that we, we just don't have the, the policy flexibility. There's, there's a fear around doing things um, because people might be um, you know, held accountable um, or not get their bonuses or not meet their KPIs if we do certain things. So I think the, these are, yeah. this is a, a, a difficult, um, it's yeah. Um, so I think those are some of the challenges. But I would like to to have a discussion about that. And I, I hope that Yulisa is still here because I'd love to to um, kind of spring upon her and ask her for her take on this as well as, as Sean and Offensa. And, and um, yeah, Sean and Offensa, just to bring in quickly uh, uh, into the short term as well. Uh, if a if a national state of of disaster is not a time to to try something and to have policy flexibility and emergency responses. Um, when is a good time? Do we need to start a five-year policy process? Or uh, I'm not sure, Sean, if offense if you. But it seems to be, sorry, I know I'm interrupting. Um, it seems to be, have given an opportunity for a very, very top-down um, flexibility, if I can put it like that. It's a discovery that you know if there's if there's if there's political will, you can change everything. But yeah, but in a in a not a particularly consultative way. Yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> it's probably true. Um, I think local. So local municipalities are not as heterogeneous as what they should be so that they can respond naturally to an immediate local and context specific issue. Yeah. And what's worse is their capacity to absorb experiments and new ideas and try them out sort of forces NPOs and you know community organizations to fall almost by the wayside, whereas they are fundamentally tied to local mm -hmm. public services. So the presidency's um, program for um, short-term employment is a, a real response to this, to sort of um, start to gear our economy up to streamline the kind of work, unpaid work that we're seeing on the ground. But at the same time, municipalities lack the kind of power um, from a ground level perspective, um, from a policy perspective to actually do the work, even though they probably have the influence on the ground to do the work. So there's this weird um, play, which, which again is attached to this sense of over-regulated, um, um, yeah, sort of a sense of over-regulation and not necessarily responding to inspiration, you know, which is really worrying. Mm. It could be cheeky before Sean and if you want to share something is, uh, isn't sort of the last two or three decades of what we've been doing a clear sign that we, we can't just do exactly the same? Um, uh, or, or I suppose not to put transport departments under the bus, but you know, if we look at our cities, do we, do we want more of this really? Um, uh, Sean? I uh, will, I'll get uh, to the, the points around what we've been doing for decades a bit later in the long term uh, session. But my 
to, to, to push back slightly to say that it's not just transport that struggles to react. I think that it is also a um, an, an aspect of our political and governance system that we have. We have quite a hyper-competitive political system, very reminiscent of, say, the American system. And it does mean that um, liability around political decisions and the, the toxic words of wasteful expenditure can end political careers very quickly. And so there isn't that appetite um, to, to take the kinds of risks and experiments that, that may need to be taken in, in these types of crises. On the other side of that though, in the not so short term, there is then some flexibility in the political side to change direction. And I do feel that the officials, the, the transport planners and engineers react to the change in direction, especially if it's happened multiple times in the same city, with trying to create continuity and consistency to, with this mindset that, you know, transport systems are a slow moving behemoth that builds over time. It's, you know, you build Rome one brick at a time, wasn't built in a day. There's a mindset that sits in around that. And in some respects that can help because it does push around a kind of whiplash effect of changing direction if you suddenly get new leadership. But what an unforeseen or probably foreseen consequence, but I guess the trade-off made there, is that we just do not have that level of reaction and response flexibility that we probably need for the crises that are coming in the future. Yes, I think your, your point about, about uh, political uh, anxiety is, is very much the case. You know, I think of how um, even when, when some possibly bad decisions were made in local government around sort of initial BRT and possibly around electric buses, to some extent, those, those were courageous decisions, even though they might not have been the right decisions. But, there's, but there are few people who would risk um, really making those kind of decisions because of the fallout. So even minor decisions like permitting a, you know, a, a almost cost-free pop-up bicycle lane, you look at the issues around in Cape Town, things like um, moonlight mass, permitting people to cycle at night, the way you have to have permits for everything. And, you know, disaster management plans for, for everything, even some kind of activation or advocacy event. There's so much anxi anxiety around if something goes wrong, um, whether it's, and it's exactly, I mean, people have lost their, their uh, positions in, in municipalities because of decisions. So, yeah, but I think in terms of the, of both short, long and medium term, again, you know, what Rashik was saying about how you know, have we not learned yet in the last few decades? Well, you know, no, we haven't. But I think one of the issues that that COVID, a, another lesson that I think we need to learn is to understand precisely why we need need mobility or don't need mobility. Because what we what we learned during the first five weeks of lockdown was why people do need to move. And I, I liked what what Julissa was saying about how we should only have to to travel if we if we want to not because we need to but it became so evident what the purpose of mobility is it's not it's not because we feel like going somewhere but because we need access to our whole list of, of, of things that we need access to and so if if we looked at cities from that from that perspective so instead of looking at okay what what are cities like how can we use what we've got to kind of retrofit and try and change things, but to look at what do we really need? What do we want? What is it that we most missed or most wanted when we couldn't access it? And try and, and understand then the purpose of mobility, the purpose of cities, the purpose of us living, living together and try and build from there. So build from, from that headspace rather than, um, than the way somehow we seem to be looking at it now. But, you know, what did, what did it become very evident that we want from, you know, do we want to access, be able to see people um, and try and understand the 
the point of of the of us living in these these collectives and how we can how we can access that moving quickly to the to the medium term <laughs> I think just to turn this, uh, the description of the session on its head, um, I suppose, what does recovery mean? Um, so when we say, how do we plan to recover in the, the medium term, are we saying that uh, economically, we see transport planning and mobility as a means to recover, or to uh, bring back excitement to, uh, and foot traffic to businesses and, and other forms of traffic? Are we saying we want to recover in terms of um, health in terms of safe access and safe, um, efficient mobility. Um, I was wondering if our panelists have a thought about have thoughts about the medium term and, and what what recovery means. Um, and to be even more provocative, is this part of an economic recovery plan where we need to spend lots on transports to be seen to be showing confidence in the country and infrastructure and mm. and launch new new facilities so that the tourists come back. Um, uh, well, yeah, and that's another whole discussion is so that we can be seen to be doing, um, but that's a, that's for another day. Uh, I guess what comes, to mind, what comes to mind is uh, how the, the different types of recovery that, that we sort of see. So it was quite interesting that most mobility declined by 80%, um, that's grocery retail. And then I think um, people going to work that went down by like 49% or something. And then 28% up in the neighborhood. So there was a lot more activity in the neighborhoods. So does recovery then mean sucking that activity out of the neighborhoods and then throwing it all back into these um, sort of complexes of, of, of consumption? Um, that's one side. The other side is people were in many ways entering a phase where they were financially forced, one, to be a little bit more resilient, yeah. two, also were exposed to a lot of financial risk. And now with everything sort of going back into the traditional cycle, we might be entering a scenario where we all go back into you know, traditional habits uh, from a consumption, from a culture perspective. So what kind of recovery is this? Is, there, is it a recovery that is um, going to enhance our appreciation for access? As Gail put it, recreation, as what we've seen in our communities lately, more and more people were hiking than ever. And there was a real sense of appreciation you know, for you know, our world, our, our lives and our families. Or are we going back into that nine to five grind cycle that is really, you know, um, that has been quite taxing in society at scale? So it's it is quite an interesting um, it is quite an interesting dynamic, and of course there would be a different way to look at it as well. But what we're also seeing is this undercurrent of trust, where mm -hmm. trust is basically earned, and it's taking quite a lot of time. And the questions that are coming up is like, you know, are our transport plans geared for responsiveness? Are we really planning? Or are we just meeting the minimum requirements? Um, uh, and outsourcing, you know, outsourcing that exercise as well. Um, if you look at what happened in the informal economy, so what do informal economies do when there is a crisis? Um, they absorb more people. Um, but in a crisis like this one, where physical contact and market access is sort of is very limited, what kind of social safety nets are there for self-employed people who are not recognized by, you know, our labor legislation? You know, um, whereas in Uganda, for instance, the price for a power transit service went up. In South Africa, the capacity went down, but the price increases were not permitted. Um, so what kind of livelihood are we looking for for the transport operators who, by and large, operate without the social safety protections, whereas it's a requirement in the operating licenses? So there's this weird, you know, movement that we're seeing. So what recovery means, you know, it, it, in the medium term is really um, a question of trust. Like, can we really trust that everyone who is involved in thinking about, you know, our resilience our recovery 
And then again, you know, our, 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 our responsiveness, are they really trustworthy, um, you know, to make the kind of decisions that we need? A, that's short term, but are they also preparing for the decisions that we're gonna be faced with in the future without of course being too prescriptive? So it's a bit of a weird situation. Thanks, Ben. I know you had a comment as well. Yeah, it, it actually builds on on what Friends is saying, and I think that before we start to plan our our well, while well, at least the beginning stages of planning our medium term recovery, we need to ask who needs to recover and what needs to recover. And I mean, our our transport systems are largely designed around the morning peak volume commute. Now, do those car trips to the office need to recover because most of us white collar workers you know we we sat at home and worked perfectly well and a lot of people don't want to give up um, that extra hour they get in the morning that they don't have to spend commuting so largely that that uh volume of um uh vehicles that we used to design for doesn't need to recover if we shift to to what gail is saying where we we acknowledge the fundamental premise of transport planning is not movement but access and we plan for access that gives us a lot clearer view on what needs to recover. Who was deprived of access during the lockdown? Which businesses were hardest hit around access issues? Where is access growing at the moment? And how is it driving economic growth in the post COVID era, which might lead to the kind of economic recovery you were talking about as well? And I think that at the moment, I don't know if anyone can exactly tell you what the medium term recovery is going to look like, but if we keep using the same paradigms of planning for mobility around peak hour vehicle commuting, we're going to reproduce the same uh, issues and risks and vulnerabilities that we had pre-COVID. And so I think that, that there's a lot of really uh, uh, strong questions that need to have to be had around the assumptions that we use and a lot of staring into the mirror self-reflection on behalf of those who who utilize those assumptions to make the kind of decisions around investment uh, for the recovery in the medium term two things come to mind before we move continue to move uh, with the world's fastest panel discussion on to the long term the first is uh it's come through in all your comments appreciation for life and appreciation for loved ones and and i'm thinking of our big parks our amenities our beaches um in the coastal cities um uh you know in johannesburg as well with some access to green spaces and parks and there's the wilds um what if what if we created access to to these spaces based on giving people a bit more luxury of time so um, on the one hand, we ensure that a two and a half hour commute, simply because there's no priority given to minibus, paratransit, cycle, uh, cyclists, um, any form of mass transit. What if we gave some priority to, um, to mass transit or, or any, I suppose, infrastructure that moves uh, people more efficiently and then gave people an extra hour and a half in a day, but at the same time, allowed swift access to amenities, uh, in addition to building amenities. So actually seeing access as both quality of life and access to services and, and love God. So you, if your commute is cut down from two and a half hours to a guaranteed 41 minutes, um, you know, you have, you have more time to, you know, to, to activate what we all talk about hiking and walking. And, you know, you can't really how do you spend two hours in the promenade and then go back home in the dark, you know, when the taxis have kind of stopped at a certain point. So there's just two points I was thinking, sort of, I know it's a one dimensional, but you know, um, improving uh, commuting times in the one, one area, but at the same time, giving access to what we all call the appreciation of, of life and cities and loved ones. Uh, moving on to, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So I'd like to give Tom some time to the future gazing. Um, and the long term uh and i was thinking about uh the disaster management act and i think uh, this is i suppose it affects all the, the time periods but uh, we do we do really plan um, and some of the email responses i receive often uh you can read into the responses if you want to sort of take up half a traffic lane on a high street for a business's pullover you can read 
between the lines, uh, in capital words, disaster. <laughs> and whichever official, not just transport, reads that is essentially saying, you know, a disaster emergency. So in the long term, um, how do we proactively build resilience? And also, can we? I don't know, because the, um, and Sean, we recently discussed this, the, the future is not any version of the past. So perhaps, Sean, I could start with yourself. Um, are we ambitious um, to build resilience? No, we have to we have to build resilience in everything. This is is really the the conclusion of what will come out of the next two weeks of discussions in Glasgow, is that we need to build resilience into everything. And so I've done a lot of thinking on this this point, and it is from the climate change side uh, in relation to my work on that big the big IPCC report, but. Um, the work on resilience that we've been doing, the resilience, long-term resilience of African transport systems is very applicable to what has happened in the last two years as well. Resilience and crisis response are inherently linked. They're just at different scales and different speeds. And I think that the, the, the biggest um, hindrance to us baking in resilience in the long-term to our transport systems, and I think it's been brought up a few times before, is the, the way in which we plan our transport. If we uh, look back now to the plans we had 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, the plans that Yolisa pointed out, were our decisions around BRT resilient for what happened in those intervening 15 years? And I think that it's not fair to say that, you know, the transport planners should have seen it coming, all of these different things. It's almost impossible to see this type of um, crises and disruptions coming, but our paradigm of planning then needs to change because if we take it down to, to its simplest terms, what transport long-term transport planning is at the moment is it is taking data about the past and trends about the present and using it to predict the future, probable futures. And usually those probable futures are not futures that we like when we extend those trends out. And so then we create slightly different versions of those, which we call preferred futures. Futures that look like our predictions, but include more walking, cycling, greater access. And then we work backwards from those preferred futures to try to tell us or inform us what decisions we should be making today. And over the past few decades, that paradigm, that technique has treated us quite well. But going forward, it's just gonna set us up for failure. And that is because the data on the past and the trends of the present are increasingly irrelevant to the future. It is because the change that's happening is happening much faster than it used to and at a much wider scale than it used to. Climate change, technological innovation, all of these are reshaping transport at a speed that our current planning paradigm doesn't account for. And so we need to acknowledge that that, that paradigm doesn't quite work and that our, our previous plans, and this goes, I think, quite a lot to the points that Julie's made, is that it assumes top-down control. It assumes that we have control of this large system. And it, in my point of view, that was a large factor in why we pursued the BRT systems, because we could envision ourselves controlling them, because it gave us the kind of um, control that allows us to utilize the skill sets that we have as transport planners and engineers, and that is optimization. We want to optimize a system uh, so that it's the most efficient and most effective uh, it can possibly be. But that is not a resilient approach. And that is because it assumes that our systems are perfect, they're in the, the model, and we have control over all of the different parts. We have very limited control at the city level in South Africa over the existing transport modes. To think that we would then have control over the future com competing modes for access provision, like the internet, like uh, uh, micro mobility, like all of these new uh, access providers, is, is to not see what the trends are coming down, down the road. And so I think that we need to change the paradigm, but then also change our skill set. 
in the undergrad system and transport planning and engineering, even up to the master's level, we are still teaching optimization and top-down planning. We need to expand that then to building, to, to partnership building uh, and to bottom-up resilience making. And that can be a systemic approach, not just in the short term, but for the long term around the embracing of some of the things that Ulysses has talked about, the kind of bottom-up resilience that is already existing in our systems. And I think that we do have a head start on our colleagues in the global north because we've already acknowledged the major flaws in our existing paradigm. We're already looking for new uh, options, new ways of doing this. We're already asking these questions. Um, now we, we need to start conceptualizing these kinds of homegrown uh, techniques for grappling with the kind of deep uncertainty that is going to characterize the planning of resilient transport systems going into the future. Um, Gail Offensa, we have uh, a few minutes left, but I wanted to just hear your thoughts in the long term. And I'm, I'm thinking that if, if we're so intent on top-down control on our skill sets, uh, and all of us really, um, shouldn't we just let lots of mobility services arise in a way and 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 let the mix of public and private uh, give people more options and so in the long term i mean we keep harping on about this but when everything breaks down it's a minibus tax industry that's incentivized and resilient enough to respond so uh can we just allow lots of different well in a semi-controlled manner <laughs> allow new services to arise, uh, some controlled, some uncontrolled. I think one of the challenges with that um, is also emerged during, during uh, COVID in that it became clear the, the dangers of a public transport service that is primarily profit driven. So although the private sector or the minibus taxi sector is more able to to um, respond more, more quickly, it also is um, is only likely to respond uh, to in a way that is going to increase its profits because it is primarily profit driven. And and that was was I mean you know like a sudden eye opener to me. You know I mean I, I I know the minibus taxi sector. I've worked in research in that area for forever, and it just suddenly dawned upon me how how this was a problem when all of a sudden during COVID. The, the opportunity to make make a profit or make the same amount of money um, changed because it meant that that prices did go up um, because so to make the same amount of money but with half the, the uh, number of people and so that's always a challenge is that is that private sector mobility is not going to deliver the the access because if if access includes running um, late at night when there are few people or running on unprofitable routes or going to to areas off peak which is going to increase access if we are talking about access as a in terms of mobility then there has to be um in some way a, a service that has to operate that is is kind of controlled so that is that is again the the, the challenge of finding a way to have highly regulated or government or publicly funded services with, with your, your more flexible um, demand responsive informal mode. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a challenge as all these things are. We, you know, we need another half an hour before we can solve all these problems, just half an hour. Any concluding thoughts from yourself? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm taking a, a lot of mental notes. Um, so what comes to mind is um, something that um, that was highlighted earlier. You know, the so in the long run, what happens with this? You know, hyper competitive political landscape. You know, are we and and it, it, it's getting so competitive that it's becoming more of a judicial battle. Um, and then it goes beyond that into a fight for entities, a fight for control, um, a fight for projects. 
Um, but at, at the same time, society is also going through the same thing that Sean highlighted, you know, there's this massive increase in speed around how fast can we pressurize the public sector, how fast can we organize and, and, and stand against or stand for um, something. So in many ways, you know, I think our situation in the long run is, is going to be very, very different from what we actually expect or anticipate by and large, a very decentralized, um, highly distributed um, network of, of, of potentially even conflicting um, worldviews around what should actually happen in a specific neighborhood. Um, meanwhile, against the backdrop of this hyper-competitive national kind of, you know, energy with so many different ideologies about where, where our country should go. So, but beneath this, we have this, we're in a constant crisis, you know, where we've got a relatively high unemployment rate. Um, and then we have this unacknowledged, you know, um, informal economy that basically accommodates 80% of the employment market. Um, and compared to the global north, that's like 16%. And we, we haven't really caught up to that and we don't understand what that means in the long run, especially as the informal economy is tapping into the gig workspace or the aggregation space and what could happen when that starts to be, you know, what we're seeing right now is not even like the end game. I suspect that we're entering a stage where even this conference, I'm, I'm probably gonna be in another one 30 minutes from now, Sean is gonna be in another one an hour from now, and we'll probably be doing, you know, multiple activities and exercises in a single stretch of time, you know, exponentially. I mean, it's ridiculous. Where, where things are going. Is that really what we want to access, you know? Um, or, or do we want to get to a point where we still touch the magazine and, 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 and have that coffee conversation, you know, and really, you know, shake each other's hands, you know? I mean, it's weird, you know, how, how things are at this point. Um, worst of all, do we want the five-year cycle from an election perspective, or do we want some continuity from a policy perspective? Should we protect? The things that are important from political decision making. Yeah. Uh, just to close the session on a completely different note, <laughs> thank you so much to our panelists for attempting in 35 minutes to, to look at short, medium, and long term ways to rebuild our cities, not through transport, but through access, really. Um, I have a question, and I just wonder why, I'm, and Vincent, not to pick on you in particular, but uh, if I can see where. Um, my taxi, regardless of which company you use, uh, is on my phone and how long they'll be. What's been the barrier to put smartphones on, on public transport to see how close a bus or a minibus taxi is? It's surely not just about procurement, right? Uh, uh, if one phone with one person operating it can tell me where they are, how long they'll be, and we can communicate. Um, does anybody know what the barrier has been where we can see uh, uh, all the uh, mobility options and, and where they are and how, how soon I should run down to catch the bus. Are you talking about on the minibus taxi? Um... I, think, I think any system, I think whether it's BRT or minibus, mm -hmm. uh, why can't the commuter and the user see where the services are, how close they are, if it, all it takes is, is a smartphone in a vehicle? Is that procurement? Is it privacy issues? Um, I know um, also some work I did quite a while ago, I mean, a few years back, about um, technology on minibus taxis was there was concerns about um, not so much privacy, but the fact that um, people didn't want, or uh, drivers didn't necessarily want their, their movements to be known. And that was uh, related to the target system, where you didn't necessarily want to share what, how you were making your income with the person from whom you were renting your vehicle. So you would want to keep your, the extent of your profits uh, sort of hidden. And if somebody is, can show exactly where you've been traveling, it would be a lot easier to, to quantify your income. So it was, a, it was related to that in that work that I did. On that note, uh, Finn Sadden, if you have 10 seconds, <laughs> if you'd like to 
to share on that's true on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's true so i think Sarah concurs sean concurs <laughs> girl concurs and uh, uh thank you so much to everyone really for contributing from emma and uh, the council chairperson at the start to yelisa with uh, opening this panel with i think 105 truths uh, to all of those who joined us through our rapid um, race through uh, through transport access and resilience. Um, there are uh, three more sessions today, which I'll briefly mention. Hopefully my team will paste them into the chat. Uh, the next session is a State of the Cities report discussion with the CEO, um, Sitole Mbanga of SA Cities Network, which uh, the Zoom links will appear in the chat. Uh, it's also on the website and on social media. Uh, followed by a session on uh, the idea of seed grant projects. Uh, and then please join for two amazing sessions this afternoon, session 11 and 12. The first is on whether smarter cities can actually help us recover and build resilience and whether they did during these various crises help at all, in particular looking at various civic tech initiatives. Um, and then to close the day on a, on a more festive note, What's happened to our creative sectors, our event sectors, our cultural sectors? Um, how do we bring people back? How do we bring back, as a friend said, that need for human connection to connect over a coffee and music? And should our cities, in inverted commas, not really have a very strong cultural creative event strategy to, to bring people back, uh, not just international tourists, but to bring people back into areas where they don't no longer need to go, by default, but actually wants to go. So that's session 12 with Marco Morgan, Dillian Piri, um, Karen Green, and moderated by Sean Dick. So thank you very much. We're only one minute late. And uh, thanks again to everyone for making this panel uh, exciting and, and interesting. And uh, uh, we'll host, uh, I'm sure, a, a three day discussion on this, hopefully uh, later this year or in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.